the talking stick. I'm reading Prelude to the Landing on Planet Earth. It's a book which um, should actually be read before The Only Planet of Tor uh, Choice. It was uh, published in 1977 and it's a fascinating account uh, by Stuart Holwright of a group of three people who went around the world in the 70s to make sure that we don't descend into the abyss. All of this doesn't make sense if you don't understand where we come from or what's happening right now, but uh, all the chapters are on YouTube and you can listen to it or you can try to make sense of it by yourself. This um, chapter four was very long called Exits and um, I finished um, halfway through, I don't know whether it's halfway, but I finished uh, when I was reading it uh, previously because um, I forgot, I think my dog was barking and, and wanting attention. So uh, the first part of this ch chapter four is in a previous recording I did, which is all on my YouTube channel and will be on my Vimeo. So uh, the narrator here is talking about the start of the work and uh, Phyllis working with, um, uh, I said, no, it wasn't Phyllis, it was um, the girlfriend of uh, Sir John Whitmore. She was working with Asagiru, Asagioli in Italy. And uh, I stopped uh, where I was saying, uh, meanwhile he and Phyllis would work together in Orlando for two or three weeks and then go on to Basining, where it was proposed that they should all gather to hold further communications the second week of August. On his previous trip to Italy, John had chanced to meet an in, in, in a Florence hotel, a filmmaker he had known in California, and they had discussed the possibility of making a film about Asigioli's life and work. So John now returned to Italy to discuss the project with Roberto, as well as with Diana. Diana, her name was, his girlfriend's name is, or was, because he's dead. Um, and I don't know whether Diana is still alive, but she sounds an amazing woman. Um, away only two weeks but in that time Roberto seemed to have become much older and frailer. He was suffering from severe arthritis and pulmonary trouble and was in pain nearly all the time. Uh, he's over 86 that uh, gentleman. Uh, but in spite of this he engaged in the work of planning the film with much vigor and enthusiasm. John told him all about the most recent communications and that the management, these are extraterrestrials, uh, had said that he would, he could and should be healed. And Asagioli said he would welcome the healers and cooperate with them in any way possible, just as soon as it could be arranged. When John uh, returned to New York, he had prepared, with Asagioli's help, a rough shooting script for the film and had made an all arrangements for filming to start at the beginning of September. 1972 or something. In the beginning, in the communications held at Ossining daily throughout the of the 19th to 16th August, some new themes were introduced and old ones were elaborated upon. This was a series that was pro prolific in its information content, but it began with a session on the 9th of August, devoted almost entirely to discussion of the problem of channeling through Phyllis, further elucidation of the theme of bioengineering. It was a particularly interesting communication from an overall evidential point of view because it purported to explain events in Phyllis' life 11 years before, events which neither Andrija nor John knew about at this time. In 1967, Phyllis had been almost totally blind. The condition was attributed by a specialist to glaucoma and her sight had been steadily deteriorating for four years and not responding to treatment so that by 1960 neither drive nor read. She went to a different specialist who diagnosed a brain tumor and sent her to hospital. But before any treatment was attempted, she acted on an impulse and signed herself out of the hospital demanding that the specialist should give her six weeks to see if she could heal herself. 
She went to a remote spot in Pennsylvania near where she had been brought up and sat on a mountain for five weeks. At the end of that period, her sight was completely restored. She attributed the self-healing to meditation and self-analysis. Analysis. She had always believed, she says, that if you cannot hear, it's because you refuse to listen. And if you go blind, it's because you refuse to see. So she looked inside very closely and realized that what I refused to look at, what I was blind to, was the fact that I was using my psychic abilities to control people and make them dependent on me. This, she says, is what my analyzation of it was. Tom's version of the story was different. Tom is the speaker for the nine, uh, for the council, the extraterrestrials. Her blindness, he said, was our fault. In 1963, when an implant was put in this brain, because of the sensitivity of this being, and us not realizing that this sensitivity had been carried from our zone to this physical planet, this created a problem in the physical body, and this was the reason for the loss of eyesight. We were also responsible for removing her from the hospital, because we knew at the time that this implant, which was a physical implant, would be found. We then had to work on overcoming the mechanics of the physical implant. At the time that we did this, we also, in error, erased part of her memory. This is why it has been difficult for her to find the proper words. We also did another thing, which was an error, and which she does not understand and has never questioned. At one time, this being, being Phyllis, played concert piano, but she no longer can remember a note. This is an interesting explanation of facts that were known only to Phyllis at the time of his communication, namely that she had gone blind and apparently miraculously recovered her sight and that she had once been able to play the piano but was no longer able to do so. Readers disposed to believe that her unconscious generates the information that she channels might argue that the difference between her conscious explanation of the recovery of her and the explanation she gave in trance does not validate, invalidate the theory because conflicting intelligent functions are a common phenomenon in psychopathology. I don't know what's the matter with my dog. Probably has spirits here. But the sequel poses problems for this explanation. And Richard asks, what was the purpose of the device they had planted in Phyllis' brain in 1963? And Tom said it was to translate our language into your language. May I just ask, said Andrija, um, he's featured much in this story, what kind of language is yours? Is it digital, numeral, tonal? What is the nature of your language? It's not really a, truly any of those, Tom said. Tom speaks for the Council of Nine. Although perhaps we would say, it would be more no tonal than anything else you would understand. And what is the frequency range you would operate in tonally, asked uh, Andreja. It would be 98.6 hertz in your terms, Tom said. We have different terms, Andrea said. <laughs> Does that mean cycles per second, hertz, kilohertz, megahertz, or what? I will verify this, Tom said. And after a long pause, continued. It is something beyond your knowledge, but they tell me it would be closer to mega cycles. Okay, I understand this, Andrea said. So your implant was to step down your high frequency language to our very low audio frequency, to transpose your values to our values. Is this the means you are using right now to communicate with us? Tom confirmed that it was that the implant was functioning, but that they had not been able to fully rectify the errors of erasing part of uh, Phyllis's memory, which was why they often had difficulty in finding the right words for their communication. Perhaps Phyllis's use of the word analyzation instead of analysis, analysis in her explanation quoted above of how she recovered her sight may be an example of the kind of difficulty they encountered. That Andrija was at home discussion in electronics with Tom came as no surprise. 
For in the past, he had invented an electronic healing device about which I will have more to say later. He now asked whether this instrument would be of any help in Phyllis's case. I must verify this, Tom said, and after pausing to do so, went on. They tell me it would be all right because it is similar to the charge. Yes, this is what essentially happens, Andretta said. The charge on the membranes of the cell is increased and this increases the function. This dialogue is, as I've said, particularly interesting from an evidential point of view. For to maintain a thorough psychological explanation of the communication, it would be necessary in the light of this material to argue that both Andreja and Phyllis generate the information at an unconscious level. Andreja did not possess the knowledge about Phyllis's past to create. Tom's explanation of her blindness and memory loss and Phyllis did not possess the technical knowledge to supply the terms mega cycles and particularly to specify the effect of Andreja's healing service. Therefore, there, these facts create problems for the two most obvious parapsychological explanations of the communications. That Tom is a secondary personality of Phyllis or that Phyllis is functioning as a channel for information emanating from Andreja. In addition to using the electronic device, Tom said, Phyllis should rest as much as possible and should sleep with her dictionary under her pillow. The periods of rest would enable the bioengineering work to be completed and during sleep she would be able, with the help of her brain implant, clairvoyantly to scan the dictionary and thus gradually make good for her verbal deficiency. Also, for the time being, it would be best for her to work as early in the day as possible. For late in the day, her brain needed to be cluttered, tended to be cluttered with the day's impressions and events. During the coming week, they could even communicate twice a day, as there was much to discuss. But it would be most important to have sessions in the morning, as they were going to continue working on Phyllis's brain during the night. They would try, Andrew just said, though he knew that Phyllis would not like it, for she had always preferred to wait, work late at night. They tried the next morning at 9.30. The session was devoted mainly to discussions of people known to John and Andrea and peripheral work, peripheral to the work. But in the course of it, Tom expressed a point of view on the prevailing political situation, which is uh, worth recording for its intrinsic interest and in view of later events, even though it does not evince faculties of insight or prophecy beyond human capability. John had heard from a scientist friend associated with the Stanford Research Institute in whom he had confided about the communications that the US government had leaked information and film material about UFO sightings to a West Coast filmmaker. He now asked Tom who had authorized the leak. It came from the White House and was handed down, Tom said. The person responsible was named Haig, H-A-I-G. The purpose behind it was to throw people off what was actually happening in the White House. It did not take place as anticipated. John said, now that the Nixon administration has fallen, would you care to comment on the incredible things that have happened in the administration in recent times? Come on in. John replied with an interesting cosmic view of the squalid Watergate affair. Before this world may evolve to the highest level of consciousness in which it was meant to be, it had to go below the pit. When I speak of this world, you understand that this nation of the United States is a symbol of the world. And when I speak of the below the pit, I meant it had to go deeper. It had to be perched completely in order for us to start evolving the entire world. In this context, John said, I've heard it said that Rome is used symbolically in the Bible to mean America and the, the leaders of Rome, a uh, leader of Rome was therefore the Antichrist. Is the Antichrist the collective administration of America? It is the collective administration of your world, Tom answered. In biblical symbology, Rome represents all the big nations of this planet. They will now all fall. There will be a purging of all the governments. In the American government, we now have President Ford, and a lot of people feel that he is rather weak and ineffective. Have you any comments?
comments to make on that, Don said. The situation is not completely at rest, Tom replied. There are going to be more scandals. Ford will not be able to be touched, but because of his weakness, there will be scandals around him. At the time of this writing, Ford had left office having completed his term, and although numerous scandals surrounded his administration, he personally was quite untouched by them. One might be tempted to applaud Tom's prophetic powers, except, of course, that for a prophecy to be convincing, we must have an element of the unexpected or improbable. And to foresee scandals rocking a government in our day and age doesn't even require ESP, let alone omniscience. The second communication held on this day in the last afternoon was an unusual one. Tom began by putting a proposition, proposition that they should take Phyllis right away to their dimension and hold a meeting with her present so that things could be explained to her directly and she would report back. When she arrives, he said, we will turn her vocal over to you and you can ask her questions. She may or may not answer you, we're not sure. We've never attended before. Andretje agreed to the experiment and he and John waited patiently while the interdimensional journey took place. After about half a minute, John, Tom said, Tom, we have her now here before all of us to understand what's happening. The body is now split in two. We're working, we're going to be working in our world as well as in yours. And Richard said gently, I am dress, I'm addressing the Phyllis who is there, here on earth, and asking her to reach the Phyllis who is out there in space. Is it possible for you to be from where you are, Phyllis? Phyllis was silent for some time, then said in a low, hesitant voice, I'm in a big building. We're having a meeting. For the next seven or eight minutes, the silence was punctuated only by short, incoherent phrases from Phyllis. Presumably her responses to what was being said at the meeting. Her voice expressed by turns puzzlement and distress. No, I don't want, no, no, it does not. Yes, I will tell him, but they don't understand. You understand, they don't understand. I'm in a place and there are nine. They are my friends. I have to make you understand. But I can't do that. But he doesn't even remember. I'm in this big place and there are nine and they are reminding me of the commitment. I know them. They're very, very loving. They don't understand our emotions. Emotions. They say they've made an error in me. It can be corrected. I'm working in two places. It is very difficult. Her distress increased and assured her that her physical body was prepared. She became calmer. Then suddenly her speech became more fluent as she explained what she was being told about their We were here before. That was in the beginning. Then we incarnated for some reason or other, not in this particular position, but in all the of this planet. We lived here, each of us, maybe three or four times before. But it was to get the pulse. But at the same time, we performed a service. I don't quite understand what is so important about this planet Earth. It's like really bad it's holding back the universe that's what it's doing this planet earth is holding back the universe so then we made this commitment this is something you're going to have to help me understand we committed to the beings here that would open up the consciousness of the physical beings that live here we are physical beings but at the same time we're not. None of us are. And Richard said, so we're committed to open up people's consciousness. For what purpose? And Phyllis relayed the answer. Well, because this planet has lagged behind. It has progressed like it's supposed to. 
They say that if this planet does not progress, you see, beneath this planet there are other civilizations and this planet is stuck. This planet Earth is completely stuck. Yes, it's a break on the whole system, Andrita said. So we are here to raise the level of consciousness of this planet. So explain to people that there are other things, other civilizations, that there are other people with more technology that can help raise it. But this planet is so bogged down in pure ego and without harmony and out of balance. That's upsetting the master plan. Does that make sense to you? Phyllis sounded as if she didn't make much sense to herself. Yes, but what do we do about it? Andrea said. How do we raise consciousness? So far we've done very little. They're saying you're wrong, Phyllis says. They append then apparently her role in the master plan was explained to her in more detail and she learned about the bioengineering work that had been done to her and the mistake that had partially incapacitated her. Part of the original plan had been that she would be able to relate information about physics and mathematical formulae, but they had found that it didn't work. However, they could use Yuri for this purpose. Yes, Andri said, Andrita said, Geller had transmitted complex mathematical flawlessly when he had worked with them. He asked Philip, Phyllis to ask whether Yuri was part of the same mission that they were involved in. She reported back that he was and that uh, he would be a perfect being if they could add humility and softness. But that when he had been prepared for earthly existence with implants when he was young, they had programmed, uh, programmed in an excess of ego consciousness because they thought he needed an ego in order to function because this entire world, this entire planet Earth was all ego. His testing time, Philip learned, would come in the following January-February period and after that he might come back into service. Wait a minute now, I have to go somewhere, Phyllis said suddenly and some, after some time she said in a trance voice, this is Tom, we've taken the being away to explain things to her. Welcome back, Tom, Madrid said, and there are 15 minutes of normal communication on a variety of topics. In the course of this, there occurred a brief and amusing exchange which nicely illustrates the difficulties the communicators had in finding appropriate terminology in Phyllis's brain. And Ritter said, may I be so bold as to ask for some characterization of the nine beings that Phyllis went and talked to? Who are they in our simple language? He was particularly interested in this information because of his previous communication with the nine to Dr. Vinod. Tom answered, in your world, to use one of your phrases, they would be nine bananas. Andrew de laughed. You don't quite understand the meaning of that phrase. Is it a mafioso expression or something? They are tops, Tom said. Oh, I see, they're top bananas, Andrew said. Are they the same nine that appeared years ago to Dr. Vinod? Yes. When Phyllis returned to her physical body and came out of trance, she was exuberant and eager to express the new understanding she had acquired through her conference with the nine beings who, she thought, were a kind of cosmic governing council. She recounted what she had learned with her own kind of eloquence. This universe is so big you wouldn't believe it. They showed me this chain of all the galaxies and planets and things and you know, this planet is doing such dumb, stupid things. Inside each galaxy there are solar systems, is that right? Yes, Andrija said. Well, I guess I learned something about astronomy. And each solar system inside the galaxy, each one has to do its thing in order to clean up the galaxy. And that galaxy in turn becomes a part of the universe. What has happened is... We've done something to screw up our whole solar system. Our solar system in turn has screwed up our galaxy. Our galaxy in turn, because of us, has screwed up the master plan of the universe. Because there are other solar systems and galaxies that we are holding back. The problem is that in the entire universe there is no other planet like this one. 
one thing that comes through very strong is that every being that lives in the universe must exist at one time or another on this planet Earth. And if this planet goes, all souls that haven't had a chance to be here will go with it. Uh, they won't have this necessary part of the growth process for themselves any more than if Earth goes to shot. Yes, I can understand that, Adventure said. We're sort of bottleneck in a huge production line. John said, so part of our work must be to get across this idea that we are part of a larger whole. I mean, that is the expansion of consciousness, isn't it? They were engaged in was becoming more and more grandiose. At first they had understood that the purpose was to demonstrate to the world, through Bobby's, the reality of paranormal healing abilities. Then they had learned that this was part of an overall program to prepare mankind for the landing, and that the purpose of the landing was to rescue the planet from the consequences of the dire ecological crisis that, as millions of people had begun to realize in recent years, put the very survival of humanity in jeopardy. But now it appeared that this rescue operation was not for the Earth's sake alone but was part of a cosmic plan, as the Earth and its life forms were part of a cosmic order, and that much more was in jeopardy than the continuation of physical life. Is it coming back? I don't know how long it was stopped. I don't know how long it was stopped because I don't really look up to see whether the uh, uh, recording is fluid. So, hmm. Okay, I don't know when it stopped, so I'm just going to continue. It was as if two, but some intelligence had been guiding their lives. Tom said in one communication, The things you three have done over the past years were not by coincidence. And they all felt this. They were aware that events in their separate lives over several years, which were strange, the manner of their coming together when they did, and the fact that their different endowments and connections neatly completed each other, were all factors of a coherent pattern. He regarded his meeting Roberta Simio at the time as part of the pattern too, for things that the old psychologist had said particularly on his last trip to Italy, had in a way prepared him to comprehend the cosmic relevance of the project. For instance, speaking as an esoterist rather than a psychologist, Asagiglio Asagioli had said to John in one of their conversations, communication from higher sources depends upon humanity and its readiness and ability to respond positively. Mankind is at varying degrees in stages of comprehension and understanding. This is part of our work towards preparing mankind for the elevation of the hierarchy. We must note that it is not so extremely important what will happen. The destruction of form is not important, and only material form can be destroyed. Souls are eternal and therefore cannot be destroyed. We can gain a sense of proportion by recognizing that there are 60 million monads or souls in the universe and only 4 million are incarnated at present. Dubious though he was about the physical landing of extraterrestrial beings on Earth, Asit Chioli, with his talk about preparing mankind for the externalization of the hierarchy and about the number of souls that were incarnated, was clearly talking about the same sort of concept as Phyllis had picked up in her out-of-body trip to the dimension and which are jokingly referred to as headquarters.
it's stopping again, so I'm moving seat because I don't know. Signal is being temperamental. Sometimes it works better when I sit on this chair. So let's see whether we can uh, fix this intermittent signal. Hold on. Just have to set myself there now. <sighs> now I've lost my space. Now I've lost my space, but I've got my signal. Mm -hmm. Um. No, mic is not so good here. Phyllis <laughs> hmm. hadn't heard the tape of the conversation with Astrid Lou, and John hadn't told her about it. Nor had Phyllis read any of Alice Bailey's books or any other, other esoteric work which speaks of such concepts. So John found security in the correspondence between the various sources of cosmic information. John had ascertained in an earlier communication that um, Roberto was known to the management and at the conclusion of the 10th August session Tom said that they could should immediately afterwards hold distant healing meditation in order to send him strength. On the 12th of August John asked can you tell us anything about Asidiolo's Asidioli's condition at this moment. Tom replied, He had a moment of severe weakness yesterday and we tried to generate energy. There is an improvement. Do not forget your healing this evening. The next day, there was a phone call from Diana who said that Roberto had become much weaker in the last few days and she feared that he was going to die. John gently approached, reproached her for adopting a negative attitude and said he was sure Roberto would be healed and that he would consult the others and see if they could make the trip to Italy earlier. As it happens, he was to come up to Osinin that same day on the 13th of August and soon after his arrival in the afternoon they assembled to hold a communication with Phyllis as channel. Tom began by welcoming Bobby. We come in peace and love and we are grateful that our brother is here. We were all we are all with you through your trial and we surround you with love. We have faith in you and we know in times that you doubted and we sympathize with this doubt. There will be times in the future when you will doubt you when you will doubt. But remember always that our love is with you and we will try to give you peace and surround you with harmony. Because of you and these three beings here, we know that our project will be completed. We are grateful for your commitment. Invited to ask questions to start the discussion, Andrija formulated a complex and searching one. Since this is the first time that John, Bobby and I met with you together, it might help us all if you could tell us something which has been a great puzzle in my mind certainly and which might give us all a common starting point. We've accepted your existence on faith. As you know and what we would like to know is something of your natural history. We would like to know what you look like, how you reproduce, what you do for nourishment, what your role is in the universe, how you relate to the nine, what your interest is in the earth, etc, etc. It would help us all mean immensely if you could give us some idea of who you are in a descriptive sense. This bold and challenging formulation initiated one of the most informative communications they had held to date. Tom began his explanation with a clear answer to the main point of Adridge's question. We don't have a physical body, although we may put on a mantle of a physical body when it is necessary. It would be difficult to explain to you what we appear in. We appear in many forms. We may appear as a human. We may appear in an energy bar. We may appear as a very bright light. We have evolved beyond the point of needing a physical type of body. 
And would you recall that a week or two ago, two members of the household had entered the house at 8.30 p.m. and had both seen what they believed was a lightning ball in the living room? Is that one of your appearances? he asked. We were there, Tom said. At times we use your electrical man impulses and your lighting in order to come into your atmosphere and to generate. I see, Andrita said. So you could man manifest now, assuming that you had certain physical energies to draw upon. For instance, as you suggested, the plasma from lighting or perhaps water, vapor or even the energy we could give. You could mold this energy into something that would manifest in our world. Is that the idea? It would be similar to this, Tom said, but our technology you would not understand. For instance, in the manifestation that took place in this being's office, we have a unit that was placed over the office and through this we were able to manifest a being that appeared to be in a physical body to her. This clearly referred to an incident Phyllis had spoken about and which had occurred some years before. It was such an extraordinary incident and so curiously linked to the events of this narrative that I must digress briefly to report Phyllis's account of it. She had been in the office of her school in Orlando one afternoon waiting for a client who had an appointment for a reading at three o'clock. At 10 minutes to three, she went into the reception area to find out from her secretary who the expected client was and learned that it was a woman named Mary who was a regular and who had always been reliable and punctual with her appointments. Seated in the reception area was a stranger, a dark man wearing a dark hat suit who stood about five feet six inches in height. He looked Italian or Jewish, Phyllis said, except that he had almond-shaped eyes. The stranger said to her, I want to see you at three. Phyllis explained that he couldn't because she had a client at that time and he said, she won't be here. Phyllis returned to her office and waited. Mary hadn't arrived by 10 past three, which was unlike her. Thinking about the stranger, Phyllis wondered how he had known that the client was a woman. She went back to the reception area where he was still sitting and asked him how he had known this and also that she wouldn't come. He answered, her car, her car stalled on the parkway. Intrigued, Philip invited her, him into her office and asked what he wanted. I want you to give me a reading, he said. She touched his hand and in an instant she said she knew that he wasn't from Earth. She told him her impression. He said, that's right, give me a reading anyway. Phyllis said, this isn't why you came, is it? Why did you? He said, you've been asking for signs since 1953. Phyllis thought that she would test him and said, If you are who you say, then um, bring one of your people. She had scarcely spoken the words when the being materialized before her eyes. He was about six feet four inches high, well built, with blonde hair and blue eyes, and was wearing a silver blue jumpsuit. He didn't speak, but communicated to her telepathically that his name was Ultima that he and others were coming to help the planet and that in future she would be able to call on him in any emergency. He remained in the office for less than five minutes, then dis dematerialized. The dark man left and Phyllis watched him from her window as he got into a white Cadillac with Miami number plates and drove away. One Friday afternoon, about two months later, just as Phyllis was about to leave the office to go home, he suddenly reappeared put his head around her door and said, Hi Phyllis, everything okay? Just checking on you. As a preposterous tale, this ranks equal to the one Andrija and Yuri tell about Yuri being teleported from New York to our sinning. But to this day, Phyllis remembers the incident vividly and swears this is precisely what happened. So we turn to the communication, Andrija said, about Ultima, and Tom said that it was a name of the unit working in cooperation with them on their present project. And Richard now asked about UFOs and 
whether they were also created manifestations. Tom answered, many of these flying things that you call UFO come from our place, but uh, they come from other places also and they come in physical form. But many of them, are, they are like your movie screens, holograms. When they had been staying at Mill Hill in London at the time of the May lectures, Andrew and several other people had seen a number of aerial objects. They had counted 43 in all and Andrea had taken, Andrea had taken some photographs. On the photographs, he said now, there was a large spirally vaporous kind of figure that was quite large. Now, what would that be? That would be one of us, Tom said. We are energy. Would it have been a, would, would it, would it have been a form taken for the occasion, Andretti asked, or what they really looked like at their natural forms and their natural selves? It's difficult to explain to you, Doctor, what we do really have a nat we, that we do not really have a natural self, Tom said. We are what we think we are at the time. We exist in a zone that you call cold. Because of this, we have no problem in, com in maintaining in any manner we desire. Ah, yes, Andrida said. On Earth, we are just beginning to understand very feebly the zone of cold or superconductivity, and we know that there is no resistance there, no friction. In other words, that it's the area of perpetual motion. Is that not essentially true? It is true and this is perfection, Tom said. So from all this, Andrija went on, we gather that you are pure light beings in a sense that we don't even understand because you exist at a velocity beyond light, photons, beyond tachyons. And secondly, I would assume that you are more in the nature of what we would call soul than any other thing we can imagine. We are soul. Are the nine of the same nature as you are? We are one and the same. Can you explain the profound mystery of why there are nine manifestations of? I mean, I guess we have to use the word God for luck of a better one. I will consound with the council to see if we may relate this, Tom said. Will you buy with us? After a pause, he went on. Nine is complete. Everything is nine. In your world, you have said seven many times when everything is truly nine. There are nine chakras, which are the nine principles and the elements of God. There are nine bands around this planet Earth. There are nine etheric bodies, and going through your transitions is to attain the nine bodies. Nine is a complete number. It is this becomes one. Over nine it cancels and nine is complete. Andrew, you mentioned the communication with the nine of many years ago to Dr. Vinod and asked if this material was still valid. Ah, it was comfortable. This does not change, Tom said, but remember this, we are not God and all of you and all of us make God. Many of your physical beings defy other physical beings when it's truly them. I think that's the best way I've ever heard it put, Andrida said. Then he changed the subject and asked Tom why he and his like were concerned about the insignificant speck of dust in the universe called the planet Earth. We have explained this to you before, Tom said. Sometimes you understand and then you ask the same question again. There was a suggestion of expiration in his voice. And Richard explained, however, that he was asking the question for Bobby's benefit. And Tom said contritely, we are sorry. And proceeded to outline the scenario that had been given to Phyllis on her intergalactic trip a few days before. And that had been confirmed in two subsequent communications, which have been omitted from this narrative because their essential content is most concisely summarized in the following explanation that Tom gave for Bobby's benefit. In order for the universe to evolve, it is important 
for this planet, Earth, to evolve. The souls, have had, the souls that have come to this planet have become irresponsible in their physical bodies. The density of this planet is so heavy and thick and is... We know not the word to explain to you what this planet does to the soul. This planet is a planet of desire. The souls that are here act as if they are in quicksand and are being gobbled up and swallowed in this desire. It is important for this planet to evolve or other planets in the universe that are under this planet or surrounding this planet are not able to go forward. It has stopped the growth of the universe. It has contaminated and polluted the universe. It's important for the level of consciousness of this planet to be raised. It is, not, it is the love from this planet that generates the energy that becomes God. Many souls, when they die, are trapped in the atmosphere and are evolved over and over on the planet and seems to be going nowhere. The planet was originally created to teach a being balance between the spiritual and the physical world. But in this physical world, they've got involved in the material world. And so these beings never evolve beyond the belt of this planet. Their desires hold them to this planet, and so you will have a some multiplication that is going on until this planet will sink. They can't get beyond it because of desire, because of hate, because of greed because of enjoying their physical pleasures. We have no objections to the physical, you understand, but it is when it becomes their primary concern and they're not concerned with the evolution of the planet and with their fellow men and with trying to find a true God. You explained this, Doctor, when we listened to your conversation the other day and you called it a bottleneck. We consulted and decided that, we look, that if we looked in a bottle and there was a plug and we couldn't get it out, this is exactly what this planet is. Your description was correct. Andrita said, Could you explain once more? So I think I understand. Humble beings like us, who are very simple beings, can really help us to unplug this bottleneck. Tom answered, The energy that surrounds you and which comes from us, because you are our channels, creates a vortex that then radiates out and then can raise the consciousness of this planet. Even though you feel it is an impossible task, it is not so. You choose this situation. You willingly gave yourselves to come back to this dense, heavy planet. You have reincarnated this planet several times, and because it was necessary, but be, uh, not because it was necessary, but because you needed to understand and to get the feel of this planet in order to raise its level of consciousness. This energy, as I explained, creates a vortex of love, peace and harmony. Everything needs an energy, an energy base. We are energy, and we need you to channel our energy. This detailed explanation had been chiefly for Bobby's benefit, and Tom now concluded the session by addressing Bobby's, Bobby directly on the subject of his role, asking him first whether he was aware that he had chosen this existence. Bobby said that he was, and Tom continued, and we know that you must ask within yourself at times why. First, we will explain about Yuri. Yuri also chose to come to this planet and we worked with him and we thought that in Yuri being able to manifest in a scientific world, this perhaps would be the way to get the people on Yuri with the planet to understand the existence of other beings and intelligences, not just us. For remember, there are those who are much superior to you in other civilizations. But we also realized that the area to reach more physical beings would be in the area of health. Bobby chose this role and he has come here five times before to help the consciousness of this planet, but he was not able to complete the work. Perhaps it was both our error and your error, because your world was not ready. Although there was a time 2,000 years ago when it was, and so when and through your communication system, we will be able to reach the masses. The time has come for the people of the earth to demand from their governments, to demand from their religious leaders, to demand from their religious leaders, to demand from them, from their teachers, knowledge and understanding of what is truly happening. It is now the time of the people 
of the people. Whereas before, your religions and your governments and your society kept your masses in ignorance, kept mankind tied down. It's now coming to the time when man is demanding answers. It is now the time for us to come through on communications. As Yuri comes through on television and opens up and masks, makes people aware that there are others beside him who can do these things, particularly the children, this will cause in your world to demand answers from their scientific community. But the way to reach them, to reach men, we have finally decided is through their own physical bodies and healing. And through Bobby, many people will be healed and many will be opened to healing. Are you aware of this, Bobby? Yes, Bobby said. And are you with us? Yes, he repeated. A month before, Tom had said, apropos Bobby, things will be resolved and all your systems in motion by the middle of August. It seemed now that the prediction had been precisely fulfilled and the people were joyful in their new found cohesion and clearer sense of purpose, but though they didn't know it though they didn't know it, events were looming were to give them cause to doubt Tom's prophetic ability. On the sixteenth of August, John flew to London and Phyllis and Bob but before separating, they made arrangements to meet the following week in Rome and drive to Capalona and carry out the proposed series of healing sessions on Asadilio. Asad, Asadioli. Daily, daily throughout the week they were together at Osining, they had held the distant healing meditations. And on the 14th of August, Diana had telephoned and said that Roberto was much better. This was confirmed the following day by Tom, who said, Achilliogis improvement continues. Loss of hope in him would cause a problem. He has not lost hope. He will be well. So it was arranged that Phyllis and Bobby should join Andrija at Kennedy Airport in the evening of 21st of August to catch a flight to Rome, where they would meet John the following morning. Despite John's admonitions about negative thinking, Diana still felt that Roberto was dying and nothing could save him. She spent most of each day at his bedside in the Villa Ilario, comforting him as best she could, giving him drinks and cooling his brow. He had developed a high fever which had progressed to pneumonia. News of this condition had got about and two young medical doctors who were students of his Capalona to see if they could help him. He refused antibiotics, however, and appeared to be declining fast. On, October the, on August the 19th, Diana said, He became an archetypal old man overnight, and I believe it was then that his soul left. He became his personality. Roberto wasn't afraid of death. He knew it was a transition and not an end, but his personality wanted to cling on to life, and though he could hardly speak now he kept murmuring to me, the Americans, the Americans, and he, I kept promising him that the American healers would come. In Adrita's home at Asinen at noon on 21st of August, just a few hours before he was due to leave for the airport, the phone rang. Adrita picked it up and a voice said, we have a message, we will stand by for it to be recorded. The voice was Bobby's. But it was not his normal voice, it was more like his trance voice, but exaggerated, mechanical and halting. And Richard quickly attached his recording apparatus to the phone and then listened to the voice, which said, We tried to reach Phyllis last night but could not, and therefore we are contacting you as the director, and you must take the initiative and responsibility to do the following. Cancel your plans for the travel immediately. We will contact you again later. You must all stay exactly where you are and you get further instructions. We ask you to carry out these instructions. Two things disposed Andreja to believe that this was a genuine message from Korean and not a hoax perpetrated by Bobby. The first thing was the reference to him as the director, for Bobby had not heard the tapes of the early communications with Korean and therefore could not know that Andreja had been nominated director. 
secondly, the tape was blank when he played it back, though when he checked the appar apparatus by dialing the local time signal, he found that it was working perfectly. In his work with Yuri, Andretto had had many experiences of tapes being paranormally erased, and also he had known people receive phone calls from Yuri when Yuri was asleep. So the idea of Korean using Bobby's trance voice without Bobby being aware of the fact was not so unfamiliar and absurd as it will be for most readers of this narrative. Andrecha had to act quickly. He phoned Phyllis's home and learned from her daughter that she had left for the airport some time ago. He rang Alanda Airport and managed to get Phyllis on the phone, just as she was due to get on a plane for New York. He told her about the message and the reasons for his belief in its genuineness and asked her to return home and wait for him to call her again. Phyllis said that Bobby hadn't turned up at the airport, though when she had spoken to him at 8 o'clock that morning, he had said he would join her there for the New York flight. That was now about to leave. And Richard's next problem was to get in touch with John. He didn't know where he was staying in London, and the only person he could think of who might know was Bill Wills, a close friend of John's and the manager of his financial affairs, who had an office in Geneva, Switzerland. He called to Switzerland, was held up by the international telephone operator, who recognized his name and spent a minute or two talking about his book, Beyond Telepathy. But he finally managed to get through to Will Bills, Bill Wills. Bill had news for him. Diana had called Geneva that morning, also trying to get in touch with John, to say that Asagioli was dying. Phil had managed to get the message to John, but he doubted that he would be able to contact him again as he knew he was planning to get a late afternoon flight to Rome and would probably have already left for the airport. Well, Andretta said, we've had a message from our friends in outer space to hold everything and to await further instructions so there won't be anyone for him to meet at Rome Airport tomorrow morning. Bill said he would do his utmost to get in touch with John and would hope at least to, to be able to get a message to him at London Airport telling him to call Andrija immediately. Andrija spent the greater part of this day on the telephone and taped all the calls. The next one in sequence was from Phyllis. She said that she had been to Bobby's house and what she had seen there and what he had said convinced her that he had never any intention of going to Italy and that he had faked the Korean call. <laughs> she had noticed a tape recorder beside his phone and accused him of using it to reproduce the mechanical sounding voice of the message. And my God, Andretta, she said, that, his aura, that fear that came into it, that had a bitter argument. Bobby accused Phyllis in turn of lying and that she didn't believe any of them. Phyllis retaliate, retaliated. Don't do this to people's souls. If you don't want to work with us, just say so. He hadn't even packed for the trip, she said. So it was obvious he'd never intended to go to Italy. Bobby denied that, but anyway, that he wasn't even sure that he could heal and Phyllis said don't give me that bullshit you've proved it Bobby phoned soon after had hung up and told Andretta his side of the story he said Phyllis was upset with him and accused him of faking some message but swore he didn't know anything about a message and that he had meant to go with them to Italy and had in fact been driving to Orlando airport to meet Phyllis as arranged when his car had broken down. Andretta was conciliary and told Bobby that he personally believed that the Korean message was genuine and that he was now waiting for the promised second message before deciding what to do next and would let Bobby know when he received it. Bobby said that whatever happened, he must see Andretta soon to talk things over and would come up to Osinning in the next few days. The next caller was John from London Airport. An Alitalia official had given him Andrej's message, relaying through Phil, through Bill Wills verbatim, including the reference to friends in outer space. 
He officially, it turned out, was a UFO buff. So the message, of course, intrigued him, and he had been very helpful in getting the call through to Osinin, particularly when he heard he was Buharic, whose book on Yuri he had recently read. And Vicha recounted the whole story again for John's benefit, adding that he believed that for the they should all act on the assumption that the message was genuine, remain where they were and see if the promised further instruction comes through that evening. John said that he would postpone his flight to Rome until the following morning, but he would certainly go then, whatever happened, because he felt that Dana would need him. He checked into a hotel near the airport and phoned Andrej again to give him the number that he could contact him immediately if there was a second message from Korean. There was. It came at one o'clock in the evening, in the morning, <laughs> New York time. And this time, Adveja's equipment recorded it. After all that had happened and all that had been said, for Andrija had had another long heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Bobby in the evening, it would have been an act of supreme duplicity and contempt on Bobby's part to have faked this second message. In a later communication, Tom explained that Bobby hadn't faked it, but he had fallen into involuntary trance and his voice had been used by Korean. Presumably, his wife had seen what was happening and recorded the message on instruction that had also asked for it to be played over the phone to Anveja, who was done. For some reason, neither Bobby nor his wife had revealed this. Here's my transcription of it directly from the tape. This is a message for Andreja. Thank you for stopping the trip. We feel at this time things among your group are unsettled. It appears it has been left up to you to take the responsibility. We have asked in the past that the group rely on Phyllis' judgment. We feel at this time the group can no longer do this. We feel you are aware of the person of the ego, as you call it, which has become involved in this work. There would have been much damage to the group if this trip had been made under these conditions. We cannot answer your questions at this time. There is a lapse, a time gap in communication from us to you. We will explain this at another time. We would like to ask that you follow your impression concerning Yuri. We should ask that possibly Bobby could speak with him and you know Phyllis was against this. We feel the responsibility is yours as the director to use the knowledge that you possess to straighten, straighten these matters out. Matters out. There will be no communication. We will not be able to explain completely tonight. We feel you must sort things out and decide. We do not fully understand all of your emotions. Therefore, we ask you to be the one. We must leave at this time. There were three statements in this message which were consistent with the earlier communications. Firstly, was the repeated reference to Andrija as the director. Second, the statement, we have asked in the past that the group rely on Phyllis's judgment. And third, we do not fully understand all of your emotions. The latter statement was one that had come into the communications very recently and Bobby had had no contact with the group since he left London in May. And though the two former statements referred to communications of the earlier period, when he had been closely involved, he had never, so far as anyone knew, had an opportunity to listen to the tapes. On the other hand, the anti phyllis attitude and the recommendations to arrange a meeting between Bobby and Yuri were consistent with Bobby's personal feelings and wishes at the time. It was a puzzle. But on the whole, Andrija found the internal evidence for the authenticity of the message the most weighty, and he phoned John at his hotel in London report to report that what had happened catching him just before he left to catch the flight to Rome. The message did not affect John's plans, and his flight arrived at Rome Airport at 10 o'clock on the morning of the 22nd of August. That was about the time when the, when the group were expected at Capalona for the transatlantic flight that Andreja and the others should have been on that landed at 8 o'clock. There was no telephone at the Villa Illorio, 
so Diana had no idea of the dramatic events of the last 24 hours. She had kept assuring the dying Roberto that the American... It was at just this time also, 10 o'clock, that he had fallen into a coma and his blood pressure had dropped sharply. Her last conscious contact with him, Diana recalled, when she held before his eyes one of his favourite pictures of the galaxy. He had nodded and smiled, faintly, as if to say, yes, I am part of all that, it's okay. John had recorded his recollection of the events of the next hours, and there's no need for me to attempt to embellish his account, which is poignant in its sensitivity. So I drove from Rome to Capalona, arriving there about 12.30. My worst fears were confirmed when I saw from the bottom of the hill that Roberta's house was surrounded by cars, for I knew that this meant he was either dead or dying. I drove to the house with some trepidations, and when I arrived, Diana came running out. She had been in Roberta's room. Somebody had told her there was a car coming, and she was absolutely mortified to find that I was on my own. She was incredulous and angry. She clung to me, saying, why, why, why? And I couldn't explain anything. She didn't hear a word I said anyway. After two or three minutes, she turned and ran back into the house, and I followed about ten minutes later to find her sitting at his bed, holding his hand. Around the room, there were about twenty or thirty people just watching this pathetic sight of Asigilo, Asigioli, lying naked on his bed, obviously having great difficulty breathing, certainly not able to speak and conscious. The tragedy was made worse for Diana by the fact that since the previous day, the people with Roberto, including a number of medical doctors who were very close to him, had all given up hope, which was why the family had all gathered. Diana was the only one who had maintained hope and faith that he would be healed, they had not exactly made fun of her faith, but certainly felt that it was American emotionalism. I spent an hour or so in the room. Diana completely ignored me and simply busied, busied herself doing anything she could for Roberto, wetting his lips, squeezing a cotton of water upon his open mouth, and she seemed quite oblivious to anyone. By, the, by four in the afternoon, I, I couldn't stand it anymore down to the Villa La Nusa and stayed there alone. Night drew on and I went to bed. I knew that Diana didn't return, that, that, that when Diana didn't return that Roberto must still be alive. I fell asleep and was wakened at seven o'clock in the morning by Diana banging on the door. I went down to let her in and as she came in she finally collapsed into a fear, fearful convulsion and told me he had died an hour and a half before. We then went upstairs and I held her for about five or six hours while she cried. Late in the afternoon she pulled herself together for a long enough to go and buy a mass of flowers for his funeral. There was nothing more that she could really do for him. She came back to the house and spent most of the time for the next day and a half crying. There was nothing I could do to comfort her and I just took her a very long time it, it just took her a very long time to come out of it. But the one thing that sticks most vividly in my mind is the pain and agony and disbelief on her face at that moment when I arrived at the Villa Ilario without Bobby, without Andreja and without Phyllis. I think she was betrayed by all of us, by me and by God. Two days later after Asigioli's death, while Jan Dinah was still grief-stricken and John was doing his best but feeling powerless to comfort her, Bobby went up to Osinin. He agreed to Andrej's request to be put into deep trance in order to serve as a channel for Korean, so that Andrej could ask for some explanation of the events of the last few days. We feel you are aware of that work that aware of what took place, Korean began when the contract was established. We have asked for this group to come together. You have done much in this direction. We feel at this time there is much disturbance among your group. You followed what we asked. The remaining ones of the group still are not. Each one brought his own personality into this. We would like to ask these things be settled. 
There has been much work done, much time spent. We ask it not be wasted. We ask things be settled among the group as quickly as possible so the work may continue. Andretta said he was certain personality conflict problems could be settled and asked, how did this disturbance look to you from your side at the moment when we were about to embark for Italy? What did you see that we didn't see? There would have been a setback if this trip had been made, Korean answered. Things that are coming to light now would have come out in this trip. We do not feel this would have been the best way to settle these things. We thank you for handling what could have been a very bad situation in the way you did. Many will learn in the future from this group. This, this would have been starting things on the wrong foot. Andretja asked about Asiji and whether it in fact would have been possible for them to prolong his life if they had gone to Italy. Korean answered, This man of whom you speak was aware of his death. This man played a very important part. There is much about him that you are not aware of at this time. We will not discuss this now. I would like to ask another question, Andreja said. With reference to your use of the telephone to reach me, could you tell me how you do that process, since it is Bobby's voice that I hear, even though it is your inflections and personality. To me, it's a vastly mysterious process, and I would like to know a little more about it. Korean answered, first, we would like to say, this is the voice of Korean. The voice you hear is traveling to this being. You're aware of the difference in the voice. We have tried to make arrangements for direct tape, as you have asked. For the, sta for the statement. Do you understand of what we speak? Oh, perfectly, Andrija said. Because part of the trouble was, in this group, we were unable to do so. We have tried more than once to make these communications. There is outside interference of sound and electrical that breaks the connections down. We will bring information that you may understand how your electrical systems are used. We feel, though, this is not as important as the work we've asked and the work you have done, <laughs> the work you've done. These will be things that come only for your self-satisfaction. They will be of no importance concerning the healings and the other's work. A fortnight before this session, Bobby went up to Ossining. There had been a lot of talk in the communications about the management preparing a statement of purpose and a program and communicating it by means of direct imprinting on magnetic tapes. The mention of the statement in the above quoted Korean communication is interesting, for no reference has been made to it in the session in which Bobby participated in the period 13th to 16th of August, though there had been some mention of the problems of channeling energy for direct tape imprinting. It is of course possible that Andrija, Philip, or John mentioned the statements in conversation with Bobby, so the reference to it in the Korean communication does not prove Korean's independence of Bobby's conscious or unconscious mind. But as correspondence between the material channeled independently by Phyllis and by Bobby constitute one of the most convincing arguments for the probability that the communication as a whole emanate from a source independent of both of them, I think it is worth drawing the reader's attention to this mention of the statement by Korean. Later in the session, after discussing, ver discussing various matters, Andreja returned to the subject of the cancer, saying, John has asked me to ask you whether this was set up as a test of our sincerity and abilities, or whether it had to do with the fact that Roberto's death certainty and therefore it would have hurt our group to get involved at that late date. Korean answered, it would have hurt you, as you say. Regardless of whether the trip had been made or had not been made, the timing of this man would not have changed. He existed more days than was 
tended in order to play a part, in order to help settle matters in this group. To this day, Diana finds the idea that Asigioli lived beyond his allotted span in order to precipitate a crisis and a learning experience for the group as difficult to accept, as she found this death difficult to accept at the time. But when she heard the tape of this communication months later, another statement of Koreans impressed her deeply. It was, John is not yet aware of what his Diana has learned from this man. There will be much good that will come from this. A similar thing was said by Tom in a session that Diana participated in at the Osinin about a month after Astagioli's death. As he worked with you there, as he worked with you, he will work with you again, and you can then bear witness to us, because he was one of us. That was enigmatic, and it continued, and it her of another enigmatic statement made to her by Roberto not long before he died. He had told her with extraordinary vigor and determination, you will be helped. She could not help wondering whether there was any communication, any connection between the two statements and whether the two enigmas might not cancel each other out. Is memory or a longing, the myth of the marvellous stranger possessed of omnipotence and omniscience who appears suddenly out of the blue and changes the world? Suddenly there is in a man a deeply rooted tendency to relinquish judgment and independence to such a thing, to make a god of him which suggests that the world wide miss in the projection of a longing. One might imagine the Ossining communications a product of the myopoetic imagination, but on closer acquaintance we find they don't confirm to this pattern. The marvellous stranger is not omniscient or omnipotent, he insists. We are not your gods, and insists too that man has free will and must bear of it, and that the meaning of service is not obedience, but cooperation. The events of July and August certainly brought these points home to Andrija, John and Phyllis. They also brought the Bobby's they also brought the Bobby Holmes story to a climax and <laughs> this also brought the Bobby Horn story to a climax and as it turned out to a conclusion, at least so far as the work was concerned. But for the others there was much more and there were new and even more amazing perspectives to be opened up. That was chapter four of Prelude to the Landing on Earth. It was called Exits. The next one is chapter five and it's called Encounters with Opposition. That's the cabal. <laughs> Tomorrow.